So this, uh, this webinar will be primarily about troubleshooting techniques. Some of it will focus on things within the software, and some of it will focus on things outside the software, but still are good troubleshooting techniques. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, these are the main topics that we're going to touch on. Uh, always have a backup plan, basic software troubleshooting, printer connectivity and settings, camera connectivity and settings, lighting issues, and what to put in your troubleshooting toolkit. So these are all of the, uh, the basic topics we're going to touch on. First of all, let's start about a backup plan. Uh, what would you do if your printer jams, your camera dies, your computer crashes, or your lights fail? Uh, all of those are, are possibilities. A uh, photo booth is a pretty complex thing with uh, computers and software and cameras and printers all working in uh, conjunction that all need to work together and communicate with each other. And it, you know, anything in that chain uh, can, uh, can cause a problem. Uh, we do strive at Darkroom Software to make the best software possible that gives zero problems, but we're human and anything can fail. So from time to time there are problems that arise. We do try to fix those as soon as possible. But there also can be problems that are, appear to be caused in the software, but that are also caused from uh, unrelated outside uh, problems like cables and you know, printers and things like that. So we're going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. In a perfect world, nothing would ever fail. But we also know we don't live in a perfect world, so the next best thing would be to have a, a backup of everything. That may not be practical. I realize that some of this equipment is pretty costly. And, uh, you know, if you've got a top-of-the-line Surface Pro 4 tablet that costs, you know, $1,200, having a second one just laying around probably is not uh, cost prohibitive or is cost prohibitive and would be difficult to, to be able to do. But there are some other options that you can have. Uh, sometimes the next best thing is, uh, you know, something that can limp you through the job, get you, get you done, get the work out, but still, uh, you know, not as costly. For example... If you're using, let's say, a Canon T5i, those are around $600 or so, I think. So if you've got one of those, um, just having a second one laying around may not be something you can always do, but you can use a webcam as a handy backup that costs very little, really. Uh, some webcams you know, are pretty good at $50. Uh, Logitech and some of those make really good little webcams that do a great job if the lighting is good uh, for as little as you know, $80 or so on Amazon. So having a webcam handy as a backup can be a great thing. There are other less expensive backups. You know, for instance, if you have a DS40, uh, maybe you can't afford a second one. But there are things like a Canon Selfie uh, printer that's, you know, less than $100 that you could have as an emergency backup. I know it's not the greatest, and it's not the same as a DS40, but it can limp you through the job and at least get some prints out for people. So there are a lot of things that you can do to think about backup equipment. Um, now, we'll talk about pro provide relevant information in just a minute, but a little bit more on backups. Basically, you need to sit down and look at all the things involved in your photo booth operation uh, and have a plan for what if. What am I going to do if this doesn't work correctly? Do I know how to handle a paper jam? Do I know how to handle a ribbon tear? Do I have uh, backup cables if, you know, if I have a camera communication problem? Do I have a backup cable? We talk to a lot of people that they don't. They just don't have any of those things. They've never thought about that. It worked today, and so it should work tomorrow. And that's great, but if you ever got in your car that worked yesterday and it wouldn't start today, those are all possibilities. So it's always good to have a backup plan. Um, and so that's, uh, that's strongly advised. Now, if you do need to contact support, if you have a problem, providing relevant information to the problem can be a big benefit and make the call go smoother. We get a lot of calls where people will say, or a lot of emails where people will say, uh, my printer's not working, I have a Dell computer, and I'm using Darkroom. Okay, well, Darkroom makes four softwares, not just Booth, so we make three others. Dell doesn't tell me anything about what printer you have, and my printer's not working doesn't tell me what's wrong with the printer. So a little more information, like, for instance, what brand of printer you have, what model you have, 
uh, and the fact that you're using darkroom booth that tells me you know what path to go down to figure out what's going on and by saying you know things like maybe it's it's got a red flashing light on the front that tells me there's something physically wrong with the printer a paper jam or something versus just no prints come out everything appears to be working fine and no prints come out that could be a totally different problem so providing that relevant information um, you know I, I've seen people say my printer's not printing and I'm doing a green screen event well I really don't need to know that you're doing a green screen event. The fact that it's not printing is a printer problem. I do need to know what brand printer you have. Uh, so next, you need to know your equipment. That's how you can provide that relevant information. What kind of camera do you have? Brand and model. I had someone tell me one time when I asked them what kind of camera they had, they said a black one. That doesn't tell me anything. Uh, you know, Canon model T5i or T3i, those are things that are informative and tell us what it is. Uh, the, uh, you know, like a, a Nikon versus a Canon. Just knowing what Canon or what camera brand you have is very important. It's usually printed on the front of the camera, so it shouldn't take but just a minute to look at the front of the camera and see. Uh, next, what operating system do you have? This is very beneficial in letting us know. Now, Darkroom Booth works with 7, 8, 10, you know, all those operating systems, but many times the, the troubleshooting paths or the places that things are located, for instance, how to get to the devices and printers section in Windows 10 is radically different than it is in Windows 7. So knowing what operating system you have helps us be able to provide information to you to how to solve your problem. Um, sometimes people just don't know, and so knowing that is big, very beneficial. Uh, what version of Booth do you have? Darkroom Booth comes in two versions, version 1, version 2. Version 1 is no longer made, but version 2 has been out for some time. But after that version 1 and version 2, there are a number of what we call build numbers or, or subversions where we've released an update to that particular version. So the last release of Booth 1 was 1.5.296. All of these available on our website, by the way, oh, versions and everything. Um, just scroll down the page on the main download page, you'll see Booth 2 at the top. But if you scroll down the page, you'll find the older versions. So um, the next one, Booth 2, the latest release is 2.0.461. So we release updates to these all the time. Sometimes it's to fix bugs or issues. Uh, sometimes it's uh, to uh, add new features. We've been adding a lot of features recently. We've released several re new releases in the last two or three weeks. To booth 2. So if you haven't got, if you are a booth 2 user and you haven't got 2.0.461, you should do that. You go to the application uh, update section of the global settings section of the software, click on global settings, application updates. You'll see right there at the top of the screen what version you have, and it will also, also tell you if you have an update available uh, to do that. So it's a good idea to do that when you have an opportunity and stay current. Uh, many times people will call and say, I'm having this particular issue, and that issue was fixed in an older version uh, some time ago, but they still have one even older than that. So staying current and relative on that, that version number is important. But it's also important to know what version you're on. Uh, next, what printer do you have? Do you have a DNP? Do you have a high tie? What version of you, what, what printer do you have? Uh, for example, in this particular situation, a DNP DS40 has a built-in driver. The, uh, the way to troubleshoot a problem with that printer is going to be different than if you're using a HiTai 510L and it's a Windows driver. So those are things that are important for us to know. Uh, if I were uh, you know, a booth owner and had several booths that I was sending out with uh, other operators, on the inside somewhere uh, convenient, I would have a card taped with all of this information, the brand and model of camera, the operating system, the version of the booth that it's on there, and the printer that we're using. All this information needs to be in there so that operator could uh, contact the support staff and let them know uh, exactly what the problem is. Um, so uh, many times they contact us and they don't know. And it's hard for us to find out, especially if they don't have internet access where we can log in and look for ourselves. And so that takes longer and delays uh, answering the questions because we have to find out a lot of information. Uh, you also might want to add to that card our support email, which is support at darkroomsoftware.com. We officially offer support Monday through Friday, 
9, uh, 8 to 5 Central Time, but we also monitor emails on weekends for emergencies, so you know, keep that in mind as well. And then also the 800 number, 1-800-517-4522, extension 2 for support uh, during support hours. Okay, um, now let's talk a little bit about printer connectivity and problems with printers. Um, it's important to know whether you're using a built-in driver or the Windows driver. I'll explain a little bit more in a minute on how to find that information out, but it is important to know that. Uh, are there any error messages and what do they tell you? So in other words, is there an error message from Darkroom that says, hey, we don't see a printer connected, but you have one plugged in? Uh, is there an error message that says I'm out of paper? Is there any sort of error message? Uh, is there any sort of red light on the front of the printer? Most of the printers nowadays use lights that flicker, flash, you know, come on if there's a particular problem. And that red light can tell you whether it's a paper jam or a ribbon tear or just some other issue with the printer uh, that can be not software related but a printer problem. Uh, is there anything waiting in the print queue? That's a very good tool to diagnose a printer problem in many ways. For example, uh, to access that, you press F11 when you're in the controls panel, and that will take you to that queue. It displays not only print jobs, but it displays um, all of the uh, all of the jobs. So, if you're doing an, a uh, a session with, say, an email, a Dropbox, and a print, it may say page one of three printed. Okay, well, it's it's relating all those as print jobs. So that lets you know that one of the three worked, but the other two didn't. If it says something like waiting on 4 by 6 then you know that uh, it can't print because you don't have the right size paper. Maybe you've got 6 by 8 or 5 by 7 and, and you're trying to print a 4 by 6 in the printer. So the, uh, the print queue can be very beneficial. And uh, so again, you access that by pressing F11. Or you can go to the Prints tab and click on the Print menu at the top and then drop down in that drop down choose the Print Queue. Okay. Uh, did it work before and what has changed since then? Um, there are some things that uh, you know, they can radically change and people don't bother to test it before they go to a job. I'll give you a good example. Some print drivers when you in upgrade to Windows 10, let's say you're using Windows 8, you go to Windows 10, for some reason the, the some of those Windows drivers need to be reinstalled after Windows 10. That's a Windows thing and a thing with that particular Windows driver. But if you don't redo that, then it won't work. So it's important to know what changed since then. So if you contact us and you say, hey, I've got a HiTie 510L, I upgraded to Windows uh, 10 and now it won't print. Well, then our response can be, you need to reinstall the drivers. So uh, it's important to know what changed since then instead of us having to exchange several emails or a phone call or something to try to find out what changed. So that's important to know. Here's something that I wanted to point out, and this may be a little small on your screen, but you can kind of see there where it says creating print control where I've got that arrow pointed. If you're using Darkroom Booth and you start the software and it comes to this screen and hangs, it doesn't go any further, <clears throat> excuse me, then that is very likely a problem with a USB cable. What this this is indicating is Darkroom cannot create the print control, or in other words, it cannot communicate with the printer. So for some reason, it knows you have a printer, but it's not establishing full communication. And sometimes that's a bad, most of the time, it's a bad USB cable. It could be a bad connection. It could be just the cable itself is bad. So the, the best thing to do in this particular case is go ahead and click Exit, close Darkroom, unplug the printer, the USB cable from the computer, and start Darkroom again. If it starts okay, and everything else seems to be fine, then that's probably what it is. So the next thing to do is close Darkroom, plug it back in, start Darkroom again. If it still hangs on this particular screen, then uh, it's probably a bad USB cable. Sometimes just unplugging it and replugging it in will cause it to establish that connection again and it'll work. But if it hangs a second time, then most likely you have a bad USB cable and just replace that cable and you should be okay. Okay, so creating print control, if it hangs there, possibly a bad cable connection. Okay, this is a screenshot from the Darkroom Booth printers section. So this is something I want to point out, a couple of things here. Uh, let me get a little tool here. Okay, 
You see right here where it says DNP? That's the DNP logo. Right underneath it, you see the Windows flag right here and right here. So this is how you can tell whether you're using a Windows driver or you're using a built-in driver. If you see the logo of the manufacturer, DNP, Brava, you know, uh, I think it's Chiat listed in there. So if you see the logo of the manufacturer here, then you're using the built-in driver. If you see this Windows flag right here, then you're using a Windows driver. Troubleshooting paths are different depending on which one you're using. So that's important to know, and that's how you can tell. Um, if you look across here, you'll see detected zero right there, detected zero. What that means is Darkroom doesn't know it's there. Now, over on the right-hand side of this screen, there's an auto-detect button. You can click on that, and that'll force Darkroom to uh, go back and look for the printer again. Sometimes that'll pick it up. Uh, it could be that when you started Darkroom, the printer wasn't fully ready, and so it didn't detect it. Um, so clicking on that auto-detect button can, uh, can re-detect it and help that. There's also an enable disable button and you want to see it enabled. So for a printer to work properly you need to see detected and enabled. Okay, That's important. Now in this particular scenario we have what looks like two printers connected with two different drivers. If you really do have two printers connected like this Darkroom will load balance the prints between each one. So if you have a big volume or something, Darkroom can share those prints back and forth between those two printers automatically just by putting in more than one printer. But if you see this not detected but detected, you still have them enabled, what's going to happen is Darkroom is trying to send prints to this printer, but there's no printer there, and so you're going to get every other print. Sometimes people will contact us and say, I don't know what's wrong, every other session is not printing, or I have to hit the button twice for it to come out. And that's because you have more than one printer enabled, but only one, you know, uh, actually plugged in and detected. So you only want to have what is actually connected. If you don't have, if you have multiple printers, but only one of them connected at the time, only have that printer listed here. Now that I want to talk a little bit about <clears throat> Windows drivers and the copy one issue. This is something that comes up with Windows printers and it's just a Windows anomaly. It has nothing to do with our software. It's just a, a fact that everybody has to live with. If you uh, install a printer, like for instance right here you see this DS40, and then you unplug that printer from the USB port and you plug it into a different USB port, Darkroom, I mean not Darkroom, Windows will create a second driver in the devices and printers section and call it copy one. Okay, It's important that Darkroom has the correct one entered here. So in this situation if the printer is connected into copy one but Darkroom is set up to use the original one then Darkroom won't be able to print it to it because it's looking for a printer that's connected to the other spot. So the simple fix is to go to the devices and printers section see how many you have listed. You can right click on the icon and choose printer properties and then print test page and see which one actually prints. That's the one that should be listed in Darkroom. Or the best thing to do is once you install it and get it working, say with this one right here, then you mark that USB port and always plug it back in that same USB port if possible. And that way you don't have that copy one, copy two problem. So that's uh, that's a quick check if you're using a Windows printer and everything seems to be working but no prints are coming out. It could be that Darkroom is sending them to the original one and you now have a copy one. Okay? All right, let's uh, move on just a little bit here. Now I want to talk just a little bit about the... Um, uh, settings for the uh, 2x6 cut versus the 4x6. With Darkroom built-in drivers like the one for the DS40, it's automatic. Darkroom handles that for you. You just change in the software that I want to do a 2x6 now or I want to do a 4x6 and Darkroom will change that for you with no problem. But if you're using a Windows printer like the 510L in this case, it's a little different. So what you need to do is in this screen that we showed just a minute ago right here, you double click on the name of the printer. Okay, just double click on that name right there. All right. Oops. Now, and it will open this screen right here, this one on the left. It'll open this screen right here. Now, a couple of things you want to check. First of all, this should always be on 4x6. 
because even though you're printing a 2x6, Darkroom is sending it to the printer as a 4x6, okay? Die sub printers don't print 2x6s. They actually print 4x6s and cut them in half. So we're sending it as a 4x6. That page size should always be 4x6, not 2x6. Uh, the next thing you want to do is you want to make sure this allow multiple page documents is checked. Now, both of those things are the default. They should be that way the first time you set it up automatically for you, but sometimes people change it. You know, I've seen people think, oh, I'm changing to a 2 by 6 so I need to change this page size to 2 by 6 No, leave that at a 4 by 6 So those two things should stay the same. Now, the way to get in to change it to a 2 by 6 cut on the printer is to click on this Properties button in the top right corner of this screen right here. When you do that, it will open this screen right here on the right. This is the, the driver, the Windows driver, where you set that. You'd click on Pages, and in this particular case, it's slightly different for every printer because it's the manufacturer's you know, Windows driver. Um, so you need to familiarize yourself with your own printer. But in this particular case, it's 6x4 split. This is what a high t I 510L, 520L looks like. So you just choose this drop down and choose 2x6 split. And then from then on, we're sending it to the printer. The printer is going to cut it in half. Now, if you need to switch back to a full-size 4 by 6 that you don't want cut, then you do the same process. Click on Properties. Go to the screen. Change this back to just a 4 by 6 Okay? So a lot of times we get a lot of support calls where people say, hey, I'm doing a 4 by 6 at this event, and it's cutting it in half. What do I do? Okay, you go to the Printer section. Double-click on the name of the printer. Click on Properties. Change it right there. Okay? All right, next. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about camera connectivity. A uh, number of things that can happen with camera problems. Uh, first of all, is the camera detected by Windows? In most cases, whenever you plug in the camera, at the bottom in the taskbar will be a little icon that comes up that lets you know the camera's been detected. Um, it will always, unless you have sound disabled for some reason, you'll hear a beep, a little, little jingle noise that Windows makes when something new is plugged in. So that lets you know that you know, Windows detected the uh, camera. Uh, next, what shooting mode is the camera in? Now, by shooting mode, I mean the dial on top of the camera, whether it's manual or program or whatever. Most cameras nowadays come with all sorts of, quote, specialty modes, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. <clears throat> specialty modes usually don't allow live view, so it needs to be in one of the standard modes. We'll go over that in just a minute. Um, did it work before and what's changed? You know, that's another, you know, I keep bringing that back, but that's a common thing. A lot of people don't realize that, you know, they upgraded to Windows 10 or they made some other big change and they didn't test it and it, you know, it worked last week, but I made this change and now it's not working. So what changed? Uh, next thing, this is similar to the creating print control, but if you see here, if it hangs on creating picture control, it's the same concept, only it's communicating with the camera in this case. So if it hangs at this point, basically it's most likely a problem with the USB cable. Uh, again, you know, the cable may have jostled loose in transport. It may just not be making good contact. So sometimes unplugging it, replugging it in will solve that. In worst case, uh, or in, in the next case, you might need to replace the USB cable. I have seen in extreme examples, and this is rare, but it does happen, where the plug in the camera itself could be damaged from transport or something, you know, twisting and that wire kind of shifting around in transport or something. But, uh, you know, that's, that's a very rare thing that you shouldn't jump to that as the, you know, the first cause. Most likely cause is the cable's not plugged in good or something. So if it stops at creating picture control, Check your USB cable connections and maybe change cables. Okay, next. This is the dial I was talking about. If you look at this dial right here, I'm going to switch over to a little pointer here so you can see what I'm pointing to. If you look right here, you see these modes right here, M, A, V, T, V, and P. Those are the standard shooting modes. So a standard shooting mode, manual would be if you're using an external flash and you need to control the exposure yourself. P would be the next most common people would use if you're using external lighting like fluorescent lights or LED lights or something like that, constant lighting. Uh, you'd want to put it on P maybe so that it automatically sets the exposure for you. <clears throat> Modes like this green mode 
or these portrait modes or landscape modes. All of those are what's called specialty modes. And they set many of the things for you, but at the same time, they also, in some cases, lock out the ability of a computer to control them or to transmit live view. So if you're having a problem with live view transmission or camera connectivity or something like that, make sure that you're in one of these main modes right here, manual, AV, TV, or P. The most common are going to be manual or P. And so those are important. Uh, some other things that can affect your exposure we'll talk about in just a minute is ISO. That's the button right there, and that's uh, something we'll talk about in just a few minutes, but we'll go over all of that. Okay, uh, whoops. Yeah, that's camera connectivity. Now I want to talk about lighting. Um, <clears throat> what kind of light do you use? <clears throat> lighting has color. Uh, most people just interpret light. Your eyes, your brain sees light as white. So whether it's fluorescent, LED, flash, you just see it as light. But the reality is all of those lights have colors. And so, for instance, a fluorescent light is more green than an, an LED light. An LED light is more pure white. So what kind of lighting you use can affect the color of your photographs. It's called color balance. Most cameras have very good auto white balance, and it can detect and, and kind of balance for that. But where the problem comes in is, is if you use multiple lighting types. If you use fluorescent and LED, something like that, because then you've got two different colors of light, and it has a difficult time correcting for both. One or the other, fine. Not necessarily both. So, you know, know what kind of lighting you're using. Um, we hear this a lot. It looks great on my computer screen, but the prints are dark. Well, the $1,200 printer is probably more accurate in the way the photo looks than the, you know, $150 or $200 monitor that you're using. Second thing is most LCD monitors are balanced from the factory to be used for web viewing and emailing and things like that. So their contrast and brightness adjustments are typically way high for proper photo judging. So what you would really want to do is adjust your camera exposure to get a good print. Then when you get a good print, you might want to adjust the brightness of your monitor to mirror that so it looks like the print. Uh, but typically most LCD monitors especially are way, way too set, way too bright. So the picture may look good on your screen, but print darker. The, the print is probably more accurate to the reality and you need to adjust your monitor to match that. In the professional world, people spend great deals of money on, you know, color balancing software to balance and manage the profiles and monitors so they all match. Uh, but you can get close just by making the print look good with the exposure and then adjusting the brightness of your monitor to match that. Uh, the photo color is really red. That's what I was talking a little bit about lighting color. Uh, if you're using tungsten lights, that would be just like regular old light bulbs that get warm uh, and hot. Then those uh, have more of a reddish yellow cast than fluorescent lights. So, you know, you might need to adjust the color balance of your camera. That's something that's, you know, not really controlled by software. That's controlled by the camera, and lighting has to do with that. Uh, what should my camera settings be? We get this question a lot, and the truth is, who knows? It really depends on your individual booth, how far you are from the subject, what kind of lighting you have, uh, how wide your background is. There are way, way, way too many variables. If there was one perfect setting, then cameras wouldn't have all those knobs and dials on them. So it really depends on your individual booth. And, uh, you know, some, some uh, testing and setup. There are three things that affect exposure. There's the ISO, that stands for International Standards Organization, but what it really means is it's the sensitivity of how sensitive the imaging chip is. The higher the ISO number, the more sensitive that chip is to light. But also, usually that also comes at a compromise. The image quality can degrade. Now, don't get me wrong, modern cameras nowadays can go up, you know, 800, 1,000, 1,200 ISO and still produce an excellent quality result. Uh, even with, you know, especially with those small photo strips. So uh, it's really less of an issue as it used to be with film. Uh, ISO was very important to use a lower one if you wanted higher quality, but it's not as important as it used to be. So, uh, you know, those are some things to think about. The next thing is the aperture. That's how 
wide open the lens is. There's a, a hole in the lens that allows light to come in. Aperture is how big that is. The last thing is the shutter speed. And the shutter speed is how long the shutter is open. Shutter speed is, uh, with you're using flash, should be it's something in the neighborhood of 1 60th of a second to 1 25th of a second. Uh, the uh, f-stop or, or aperture can be adjusted to suit your lights. Uh, if you set it on program, the computer or the camera will set it for you, and that would be for continuous lights. With external flash, you need to use uh, manual. Again, did it work before and what's changed? So if last week you did a photo booth event and everything is great, this week, maybe you're using a different camera or something, or maybe you took the camera out of the booth and used it to go on vacation, and then you put it back in the booth. You might have it on you know, a different setting or something. So what changed? Did anything happen from last week to this week that is a little different? Here's a, a sample lighting setup that I wanted to talk just a little bit about. Now, this one would be something that would be you know, very useful for green screen. If you position your lighting, external flash, this is a soft box in the picture, but if you picture it above the camera slightly, a foot to two feet, and right directly above the camera, that will minimize the shadows you get. Lighting off to the right or left of the subject or of the camera will cast a shadow. So if you have, let's say, a light right here, okay, shining this way, it's going to cast a shadow. If you have it this way, directly above the camera, then the shadow will fall behind the people and you won't really see the shadow as much. So this is a way to minimize shadows in your photos. Also, if you see here, they're a little bit further from the background. So if you have the, the subject a little bit further from the background, then the light can wrap around the subject and have less shadows on the background. If you're doing green screen, then you may want to add some additional lighting here on either side just on the background so that it reproduces a nice bright green and doesn't have any shadows on the background. So all of those things are dependent on your booth. If you have a closed booth, this may not be possible. So that's some things you might experiment with and take a look. So if you're having problems with shadows and things in your in your booth or pictures that are too dark or something, it's, it's lighting that you need to address. Here's something that I want to touch on without getting too technical. So this is a very technical subject. Uh, called the inverse square law. Basically what it means is the further from the light a subject is, the more light is needed to illuminate it the same way. So if you look here, for example, this little sphere that's one foot from the light, very nice and bright, it's washed out. It's a black sphere, but it, boy, it looks white right there. That's because it's really close to the light. As it gets further from the light, it gets darker. When you get you know, in this case, in this illustration, six feet from the light, it's, it's near black, and it is black when you get nine feet away. So what that's telling you is, as a subject is closer to the light, it's going to be brighter. If it's further from the light, it's going to be darker. If you're using a manual exposure flash, you want to try to keep your subjects a consistent distance from the light. You know, put a piece of tape on the floor, some sort of marker on the floor, and tell people to stand right there so that you have a consistent location and a consistent light, and they're not moving closer and getting washed out or further and, and going dark. Um, so that's that's the inverse square law. But it's it's basically just the closer to the uh, the light it is, the brighter it's going to be. The further from it, the darker it's going to be. Here's an illustration of a green screen event. On the left, you'll see the actual green screen photograph. This is what a green screen dropout should look like. If you notice in this photo, the, uh, I'm going to switch over here to a uh, spotlight so you can see it. All the way out to the corners, the green screen is the same color. Okay, There's no dark shadows, no dark corners. Everything is all the same color, nice, bright, chroma key green. The result is a good dropout. You get a really clear dropout, no fringing in the hair, everything looks good, the background looks good all the way across. So that's a properly done green screen lighting. Okay, if you notice here, the, uh, the green screen is starting to get darker. The overall image is darker. Now, in this particular illustration, nothing changed as far as location of the lights, type of lights. The only thing that changed was the exposure on the camera. So I, I just changed the camera exposure so it would be darker. So this dark corners is causing fringing and problems over here. If you see here, the black in the uniform is not showing up good. The, the dropout in the hair area is not as good as it was there. 
Okay, so we're already starting to see some issues just from that little bit of darkness. If you go to this one, this image is way too dark. Now you can see how the green screen appears. <clears throat> this image is just simply too dark. It needs more light. Um, again, the only thing that's changed was the exposure, the position of the lighting and everything else was the same. So if you're doing a green screen event and your images are coming out transparent or ghostly, some people say, it's because your images are too dark. You need to brighten those up. This, this, you know, you know it's green, I know it's green, but the computer sees that as black. It doesn't know what to drop out. So you need to brighten your images. That will make a big difference. This is what I was talking about a few minutes ago <clears throat> with the aperture. A large aperture you know, might be f2. So the smaller number means a bigger opening. It lets in more light. As you go down, f8, the opening gets smaller. And a small aperture, f22, is even smaller. So the, the lens is stopping down. The hole is getting smaller. It's letting in less light. So to get f2 or f22, you need more light to get the same exposure. So that's just going to give you a little illustration there of what that correlates to. Uh, this is uh, the back of a camera where you can tell what your shutter speed is. This is how exposures are read. If you look here on the back of a Canon, it might say 125th. That's the shutter speed. That's 125th of a second. It's a very short shutter speed. 5.6 is the aperture. That's that opening in the lens I was talking about that lets light in. And in this case, the ISO, or the sensitivity of the chip, is 800. So that tells you how sensitive the chip is. Now, if you're using, let's say you're using this exposure right here, and your pictures are too dark, you're using external flash, you're already pretty close to wide open. You could go up on a little bit more, but not much. You might need to go up on the ISO. Conversely, if your pictures are too bright, you might want to go down on this ISO or close down on the aperture. Shutter speed should stay the same with external flash. Continuous light is where you would change the shutter speed. Same thing over here. This is the back of a Nikon. They're just basically the same things, but in different places. So you can see here 125th, 5.6, at 800. Those are all things that you can look at on the back of the camera to see how those things are. Um, they also, in some of them, display on a screen on the top. It depends on your camera. All right, I want to spend just a few minutes on what to put in your emergency tool kit. Everybody should have an emergency tool kit. Uh, they really can come in handy. Sometimes you might go for years without using one. I'll give you a really good illustration. Um, I was uh, I spent many years as a wedding photographer and event photographer. And when I first got into this business at 19, a mentor photographer, a friend of mine, who was helping me out, gave me a little sewing kit. He said, put this in your camera case. You never know when it might come in handy. So I did. It was a little sewing kit. It had needle thread safety pins, things like that in it. Uh, years went by and I didn't use the kit. It stayed in my camera case, never used it. But one time at a wedding, I had a, a, a tear in my pants. Now that sounds embarrassing, and it was potentially very embarrassing, but I, I, I tore my pants. And so I caught a brief moment, excused myself to the bathroom with my little sewing kit that he gave me, and I used the safety pins in it to, you know, do a rudimentary rudimentary repair to those pants and got back in operation and finished the job. Uh, that little sewing kit came in very handy that day and I've never gone to a job since he gave that to me without that little sewing kit in my camera case. Uh, you never know when I might need it. Didn't need it for years but I needed it. So what do you want to put in there? Perfect world, at least one spare of everything. I know that may not be possible. Maybe you can't afford that Surface Pro 4 times 2 but uh, at least, especially, there's no excuse for not carrying an extra cable of, you know, or two or three. Uh, I usually buy USB cables for camera and printer on Amazon.com, and you can get them for two or three dollars a piece. I buy them ten at the time, and you know, if I have any inkling or any suspicion that a cam a, ca a cable is giving me a problem or could be a problem, I throw it away. It's just not worth the three bucks that it costs to deal with the problem. So, a spare. Uh, it's a good idea. <clears throat> excuse me. It's a good idea to have a thumb drive with your software and drivers on it. Uh, in, a, in the event of a really bad situation, you could borrow a computer for someone, or you could run down the street to the nearest Best Buy and buy one, or something. If your computer were stolen or broken or lost or crashed, uh, but if you don't have the software or the drivers you need for your printer, what are you going to do? 
So if you have a thumb drive with software and drivers, you can install that real quick and get back in operation. Uh, your activation for your code, that goes back to the, the thumb drive. You know, I would uh, maybe put a, a text file with your activation code on there or something so you know what that activation code is. And so you have that if you need it. Um, you can also contact our support through support at, uh, at uh, darkroomsoftware.com. And we can, in many cases, give you a temporary code to get you back in operation uh, to, to we can work out your permanent code. So that's, a, that's something that we do quite frequently, email people a temporary code to fix a, a broken computer problem or something. So keep those kind of things with you. Uh, know your system details like we talked about before, your camera, your operating system, your printer, etc. Have that information with you in your toolkit. Uh, scissors and scotch tape. Uh, that's uh, you know that's that's uh, a vital thing if you have a ribbon tear in your printer that's a great thing you can pop out a ribbon that's just broken completely in two you can pull it back together cut off the edge you know make it straight scotch tape it together roll it back on there and get back in operation so scissors and scotch tape are uh, very handy in that situation um, so I would always keep something like that. As I mentioned earlier, a sewing kit. Boy, that really saved my day that day. So having a sewing kit handy can also be a great thing to keep with you. Uh, all of these things that I have listed here should not take up very much room, but I would not ever go to a job without them. I never have, never will. Uh, a little bit of uh, you know, planning and thought can go a long ways toward having a smooth event. Uh, just a, a last little testimony here. I've mentioned before I've been in the event photography business for 36, almost 37 years. And uh, in that length of time, I have never, ever, not one time, not been able to deliver a job. Uh, that doesn't mean I didn't have problems. I've had problems. I've had cameras break. I've had, you know, all sorts of things go out. But I always had a backup plan. I always had backup equipment available to cover myself in those situations, or at least knew where I could get that to get back in operation and had someone uh, that I could contact to help me out and get that equipment if I needed it. So having a backup plan, what am I going to do if this happens? What am I going to do if that happens? And, uh, you know, backup equipment can go a long way toward saving the day and, and keeping your sanity in, a, in a, what can be a very high-stress situation. I hope you learned something today, and uh, we'll be doing more webinars in the future. Stay tuned uh, for those, and have a great day.